Hello there, Preacher Bob here. If you're over the age of about 30, then you probably recognize this cartoon character over here as Underdog. As a boy, I remember watching the Underdog show as part of my regular Saturday morning routine. Now, Underdog was a mild-mannered, unassuming pet who just happened to have superpowers. Whenever the community was threatened by the evil doings of Simon Bar Sinister or other villainous nasties, then he would dash into a nearby phone booth or scurry behind a bush and he would emerge as underdog in order to save the day. This other character is likely not so well known to you. This is David. David was another underdog, but trouble is he didn't possess any superpowers. He's just a, a simple shepherd boy who winds up confronting a giant. Now underdogs are called underdogs for a reason. They're usually outnumbered, they're smaller, they're weaker, they're lacking in, in weapons or tools. Contemporary logic would suggest to us that they shouldn't prevail and yet what we find is that they very often do. Why is that? How could a tiny little shepherd boy prevail in a duel to the death against an armed and an armored giant? Well, to find out that answer, buckle up, hold on, going to be a bumpy ride. We're going into extreme church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, stir in us now a willingness to hear, a desire to know the truth, and the courage to follow in faithful obedience that we might be formed by your word into men and women of faith. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. The text that I intend to use for the message this morning is taken from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 49. Attend to these words. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. And Saul answered David, he said, you, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. He, he's been at this fighting business since before the day you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd tending my father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it. I'd knock it down. I'd rescue the lamb. And if it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring his neck, and I'd kill it. Lion or bear made no difference to me. I killed it. And I'll do the same with this Philistine pig that's taunting the troops of God. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, okay, go ahead. God help you. And then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. And David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, he said, you know, I can't even walk with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And so he took it off. And then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand, approached Goliath. As Philistine paced back and forth, his shield bearer in front of him, he noticed David. And he took one look 
down on him and he sneered, a mere youngster, apple-cheeked and peach fuzz. The Philistine ridiculed David, am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? And then he cursed him by his God. Come on, said the Philistine, I'll, I'll make roadkill out of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a, a tasty morsel for the mind. David said, you come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God Almighty, the God of Israel's troops that you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me, and I am going to kill you. I am going to cut off your head, and I am going to serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. The whole earth will know that there is an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God does not save by the means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God, and he's handing you to us on the platter. Well, that made the Philistine mad as the dickens, and he started toward David. David took off from the front line, running toward the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone. He slung it and hit the Philistine hard in the head, embedding the stone deeply. And the Philistine crashed face down in the dirt. The Bible tells us that Goliath stood nine feet, six inches tall. He had a helmet that was made out of bronze. He wore a chain mail coat, he had a shield, he had armor. His weapons were a javelin and a shield and a spear and a sword. Now, I don't know about you, but a sight of something like that on a battlefield to me would be pretty terrifying. About as terrifying as a Bradley fighting vehicle that has laminate armor and chain gun and anti-tank missiles and machine gun. David, on the other hand, he he was just a young fellow who didn't have any of that stuff. He didn't have a helmet, no armor, no sword, no javelin, no spear. The only weapon he had was just that little sling and five smooth stones. Very clearly, in this encounter, David is the underdog. And so when Goliath sees him, he sneers at him, starts to poke fun at him, and says, I'm going to make roadkill out of you for the buzzards and, and a tasty morsel for all the field mines. And rather than being intimidated, David accepted the invitation. And running quickly toward the battle line, he met that Philistine, reaching into his bag, taking out one little stone, and he slung it hard, and it hit Goliath in the forehead. Goliath fell, and David used Goliath's own sword to cut off his head. Underdog one, giant zip. Now, you might think that this is a surprising victory, but actually it makes perfect sense. You see, if we go through and look at history, we find out that throughout all time, Davids have always found ways to kill Goliaths, even today. The fearsome Bradley fighting vehicle has fallen victim to IEDs. If you watch the news, you know what that is. It's an improvised explosive device. And so in response to these, the Army has, uh, the Army has developed a brand new 84-ton ground combat vehicle that can uh, that'll be massive enough to survive any roadside bomb and in the process protect those who are inside. And dads who are here among us this morning and like big, powerful tools, you might want one of these, but you're going to have to wait because they're not going to be available till at least, oh, about 2019. Now, history teaches us that Davids have always been insurgents. They find very novel ways to defeat their enemies. They refuse to play by Goliath's rules, but instead adopt unconventional strategy. Their techniques can be used for either good or evil, but in any case, they're techniques that we need to understand. 
in the New Yorker magazine, a fellow by the name of Malcolm Gladwell has explained the secrets of being a successful underdog. How many of you today who are here feel like that at some point you are the underdog? You ever feel like, wake up and feel like that? I do. Am I, am I, am I the only one who has that dream? All of us at one time or another have experience where we feel like we're just behind the eight ball. Well, here are some techniques that we can use to turn that underdog feeling into victory. Malcolm Gladwell says, uh, uses the game of basketball as an example. Basketball is a game in which usually the towering Goliaths uh, win by rising above. You see their shorter opponents, but... Gladwell believes that Davids can win by using the full court press. Now, for the sports challenge among us who look at me and they go, well, what is that? Well, the full court press is when you prevent your opponent from going up the court to the basket. And so if you are a David and you allow Goliath to get to the basket, then Odds are he's going to score, but if you press him, if you keep at him, keep him at the other end of the court, all the way away from the basket for a significant amount of time, then you stand a chance of actually being able to win. There's a story about a basketball game that was played in 1971 between Fordham University Rams and the University of Massachusetts Redmen. The Rams were clearly the underdogs, made up of a bunch of scrappy kids that came from the Bronx and from Brooklyn. The red men were Goliaths. They were led by Hall of Famer Julius Irving, whom some of you know better as Dr. J. You remember Dr. J? From the start of the game, the Rams launched the full court press, and they never gave up. They never backed down. They never quit. And their coach, Digger Phillips, just kept sending in one tough Irish and Italian kid after another to guard Irving. And one by one, they fouled out. None of them was anywhere nearly as talented as Irving. But you know what? It didn't matter. The Rams came out on top, 87 to 79. Now, over the years, a lot of basketball games, a lot of sports games, have been won by Davids that used the full court press kind of technique to beat the Goliath. And yet the puzzle of all this is that the press has never become popular. People look at upsets like the Rams over the Red Men, and they, they say, well, that, you know, that was just a fluke. But in basketball especially, the full court press is always the best way for an underdog to stand a chance of beating a giant. And, you know, when you think about it, isn't that really what David did? Here with Goliath. See, he didn't he didn't give Goliath any ground. Instead, the scripture tells us that he, he took off from the front line, started running straight toward the Philistine. He was using the full court press. I don't know if you uh, uh, how well you know your history, but in Scotland, uh, between England and Scotland, um, there were two walls built. The uh, the last one was Hadrian's Wall, and the Picts were in the north, the Romans were in the south. And the Romans, of course, they were one of the most fearsome fighting forces in the whole world, but when they were attacked by the Picts, they couldn't handle it. So uh, knowing that they couldn't beat the Picts, they just built a wall to, to, keep, to keep them out. Um, and the way the Picts would fight is that they would paint themselves blue, strip down to their underwear, and start running at the enemy yelling, screaming, and waving their swords. Now, I don't care how fierce a fighting source you are. When you come across that, somebody that you know just is not going to give any ground at all, you know, I think I might just go home. So if you want to win as an underdog, don't play by Goliath's rules. Instead, adopt the David strategy. You begin by choosing an unconventional approach, using the very unique talents that you have. King Saul said to David, he said, you, you know, you can't go fight this 
Philistine. You're just a young fella. You don't have any experience fighting in battle. And this guy, well, he's been in the fighting business since the day he was born. And Saul's right. David couldn't stand up to Goliath as a conventional warrior. But, see, David had an age. See, David could fight as a very highly skilled shepherd boy. A shepherd boy who was expert in striking down the lions and the bears and the wolves, oh my, that threatened his land. And so David picked up five smooth stones that he could use with his sling. Now, when we hear that term sling, we usually think of a children's toy. Most of you that are about my age or older, you remember slingshots. You remember how we used to find that fork in the tree and we'd use an old bicycle inner tube, you know? And that would, we'd make us a slingshot. And it really wasn't very powerful and wasn't very accurate, but it was fun, you know, kind of like for shooting your brother in the back of the head with a rock or something. But that's not the kind of weapon that David had. So he was carrying a sling, which is very simple, but it's a very highly effective weapon. Ancient armies used to use slings in battle. And shepherds like David would use it to protect their flocks from predators. Now, Sling's got a leather pouch and two very long cords attached to it, and the projectile is, is placed in that pouch. It's not a child's toy. In fact, it is an incredibly devastating weapon. Someone did the calculations on the ballistics of a sling, and the, the, the power of of a rock fired from a sling like David was carrying is roughly equivalent to the stopping power of a 45 caliber handgun. Now, that is some punch. It is an incredibly devastating weapon. And so when David lines up, he has every intention, every expectation of being able to hit that giant dead square between the eyes with that stone. And that is exactly what he does. He walks right up to the giant. But David ain't stupid. He stays far enough back so that Goliath can't use his spear or his javelin. And he kills Goliath with a single shot to the head. Now, some of you here may have seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia. And there's a, there's a scene in there where Lawrence leads a revolt against the Ottoman army uh, that was occupying Arabia at the end of the First World War. And his masterstroke was an assault on the port city of Aqaba. When they arrived, uh, finally arrived at Aqaba, Lawrence's band of about, uh, oh, a couple of hundred warriors killed or captured 1,200 Turks. And they only lost two men. And the reason for their success because the Turks didn't think anybody would be crazy enough to attack from across the desert. See, Lawrence didn't play by Goliath's rules. During the Revolutionary War, uh, the, the Redcoats, one of the, at that particular point in time, one of the most fierce fighting forces, the most highly trained fighting force uh, in, in Europe, came and uh, they went against the colonials and so here you've got these folks wearing red coats and marching in straight lines while the colonians hid behind rocks and trees and shot at them with squirrel rifles when wasn't nobody looking. They refused to play by Goliath's rule. See, this turns out to be part of a winning formula for underdogs in every aspect of life. All of us have been given a very special, unique talent by God for use in whatever challenge we face. Those first disciples, well, they were fishermen. Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to take your talent for fishing, and I'm going to turn that into a talent for fishing for people. Paul started out as one of the, as one of the fiercest oppressors, persecutors of the early church, and God took that, that passion of his, that zeal, and turned it into a zeal for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lydia showed gracious hospitality to Paul. Apollos used his natural eloquence to, to preach the gospel to folks. Dorcas was devoted to good works and charity. So, I mean, these are just common, ordinary talents. Fishing, zeal, good works, hospitality, eloquence. 
It is a diverse group of talents found in people across the community. God has given all of us unique gifts, and victory is possible when we put those gifts to you. Now, the next part of this formula is that you try harder than anybody else substituting effort for ability. The scripture earlier in the text for this morning says that David got up early in the morning and he was taking food to the soldiers. And while he's making the delivery, he hears the Philistine giant making this, making this raucous and blasphemous uh, uh, diatribe against the armies of Israel. And, and nobody's saying anything, and everybody's quaking in their armor, and David's looking at it, and he's going, hey, something wrong with this picture. Who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? And so by sheer force of will, David refused to be intimidated by that giant. And so after he volunteered to fight, David stands there before Goliath. And I don't know if I had the guts to do this or not, but he's standing there in front. I guess when you're faced with that, you might as well. If you're going to have to go, you may as well go out bold and proud and, and shooting your mouth off. David stood there and he predicted, he said, this very day, God is going to hand you over to me. In other words, one of us is going to walk away from here. And it ain't going to be you. And doing this, David didn't just try harder, but he believed harder. He surpassed his fellow Israelites in showing confidence that God was going to exert effort on their behalf. David believed that the battle belongs to God and that he is handing the army of the Philistines to them on a platter. He made the effort to stand up to Goliath. He refused to back down, give up, or surrender. He put his complete faith in God, and that is the kind of effort that any of us can make. Whether we're facing some fearsome giant on a battlefield or maybe some frightening test results that we get from the doctor's office. All of us face challenges in our health, in our work, in our education, our relationships, and in each of these cases, we can make the same kind of effort that David did, refusing to ever give up, ever surrender, never run away. We can trust that God will make the effort on our behalf, helping us to survive and even thrive. Finally, being insurgent challenging authorities about how things are supposed to be done. Now, that's a particularly hard one because we tend to have a negative view of insurgents today based on the attacks that insurgents have made on innocent people in the Middle East and other places. But insurgents can be villains or they can be heroes. And our challenge is to be an insurgent for God. David was an insurgent when he took off from the front line and he ran toward the Philistine. He disrupted the normal rhythm of the battle in which the Philistines stood over here on one mountain and the Israelites were over here on another mountain and once in a while they'd all go down in the valley and they'd scrap for a while, you know, and then they'd go back up each one to their mountain and stay there and then it just, you know, sort of rinse and repeat, you know. David decided that he was going to do something different. So he ran full force toward Goliath with a full court press. You see, that's what we're asked to do. We're asked to actually do something. One of the problems we have in the church is that we just, we do an awful lot of talking about stuff. You ever notice that? We just talk and talk and talk and talk as if somehow talking is doing you know, and I think sometimes the psychology behind it all is that we, we really don't have any intention to do anything, but talking about it just makes us feel better. You know, it gives us the illusion that we might actually someday do something about it. You know, it's kind of like I heard a fella one day talking about he grew up in a mobile home park. 
And he said, you know what a trailer is, don't you? He said, a trailer is a home that's got wheels underneath it that gives you the illusion that you might actually go somewhere in your life. Talking is the same way. It just gives us the illusion that we're actually going to do anything. Now, do you think David stood up there on that mountain and was just cheerleading the troops and, you know, trying to get everybody hyped up? No. David took it upon himself. He put his faith into action. He became an insurgent and in so doing changed the entire course of what was happening. And the sudden astonishment when David sprints forward, it must have, must have scared Goliath a little bit, made him a better target, and David was like a point guard on a basketball court ready to flick that basketball away. Like David, we're insurgents when we righteously question established authorities, when we disrupt the normal rhythm of life. And here's an example. In Fairfax, Virginia, a lot of older apartment complexes were being replaced by new developments, and the city was approving these new developments hand over fist because, well, it was good for, it was good for the budget. It was good for, uh, it was good for the economy. But in the process of all that, what was lost were hundreds of affordable housing units for people like seniors and students and minimum age workers. So to buck this trend, a lot of church folks got together, and they launched a full court press. They formed an organization called Voice, Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement. They went out, and they started knocking on doors, and they organized residents, and they gathered data and they met with developers and they testified at city council meetings and they just kept pushing and pushing and pushing until finally the mayor and the city council decided that they were going to put more affordable housing units into play. You see, we can be insurgents for God. David shows us that we can be victorious when we choose an unconventional approach when we try harder than anybody else and when we righteously challenge authority. All of us have been given a very unique set of talents by God who can be trusted to work for good in our lives. That's what the Apostle Paul says, all things work for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So my challenge to you this morning, probably somewhere out there, there's five smooth stones just waiting for you. I challenge you to pick them up and run toward that battle line. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord of the storm and the calm, the vexed sea and the quiet haven, of day and night, of life and death. Grant us the grace to have our hearts stay upon your faithfulness, your unchangedness, your love, so that whatever happens, however black the cloud or dark the night, with quiet faith trusting in you, that we may look upon you with untroubled eye and walking in lowliness towards you and in lovingness toward each other. By all storms and troubles in this life, begging that you may Turn all of these things to our soul's true good. We ask it for your mercy's sake, shown in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.